So welcome back to the third and final installment of kayaking on the North Slope of the Winters. I put a hat on so it makes it look like this video has been a different day. So you're welcome. So part one, we talked about the broad history. And part two, we talked about sort of the demographics. So part three is going to be talking more about the dirt, the archaeology, and what's left up on the North Slope of the Illinois Mountains. And so that's why it's good to have an archaeology hat. So without further ado, let's get it started. So all the history gives us some flavor of what's going on. But to me as an archeologist and as you as a recreator, you know, you need to understand that this is truly a landscape, that the physical features of the mountains have actually been shaped by past logging and human activity. And so we can't separate the human from the environmental anymore. Streams have changed course, plant species have changed because they were impounded by splash dams. And so there's not really a part of the Luna Mountains that hasn't seen some shaping locally from humans, let alone the impact of climate change or other aspects. So that's why I like this, you know, that North Slope of the Luna Mountains is a landscape populated with physical reminders of an industrial system that shaped forest composition, modified stream channels, and deeply affected broad patterns of local, state, regional, and national history. Now, an industrial system merely means that there's raw materials, there's refining the raw materials, there's the workers, it's all the different pieces. And so when we look at the next slide, we look at commissaries, satellite camps, sawmills, sawdust piles, all this has a physical manifestation on the ground. And very little historical record actually provides um, where these were, how they shaped our, our history. So this is, I think, a very important aspect to, to talk about. That photo on the upper part, that's actually some riprap uh, supporting a stream bank so the ties wouldn't flow over the bank during flow. Bottom photo is a, a, a log loading dock. So this is more of that diesel portable sawmill days that they would just roll logs onto that. And then this is actually a downhill road marker. So in the winter, right, when they're doing this logging, you couldn't see where the slope really began or ended. And when you had new fresh snow, it was important, important to have some edging. And so this is a logging road on the east side of the Black Fork drainage. And every so often there was these wooden posts kind of delineating where you could go. Uh, there's also other remainders. This is the Steel Creek Commissary. Um, most of the cabins have been gone. They've either been taken apart or actually burned. The steel fireplace from the main commissary is still in place. A lot of people will sh shove their garbage in there. I love people sometimes. Uh, but in the back, you actually still see the upper left photo, um, the foreman's house. So this would have been occupied from the 1918, 1919 period all the way up in the 1930s by the Standard Timber Company's foreman, which could have even been Broar Eaton at some point, given how little we know of the history. Uh, Suicide Park, which is right on the U, uh, Utah-Wyoming border, you can actually see that worm fence in the background. That's the state line. Uh, this fence is actually the graves of potentially three people, three tie cutters who actually committed suicide. Uh, it's right off the main road. And uh, are there bodies there? I don't know. It's just been known for Suicide Park for decades. And there are some plaques there that give you some indication of the lives of the men that were there. But if you notice, Ole Olson, Jack Rose, and Charlie Matson, you know, those are all fairly good, strong Northern European names. Uh, they'd all committed suicide, at least reportedly. So that's why it became Suicide Park. So why was I even involved in any work up on the North Slope of the Uinta Mountains? And that's because of the requirement. So the Forest Service, who manages the majority of the Uinta Mountains, was mandated uh, to find a way to manage the pine beetle epidemic. Uh, this is where those little critters would burrow into the trees, killing trees by the thousands, 60 to 80 percent fatality rate in some stands of the Uintas. And we wanted to log it. The Forest Service was looking to do an environmental assessment to do logging and prescribed fire to try to control the outbreak. And that kicks in federal law protecting cultural resources. So when I worked for the Forest Service, we did large-scale inventories. Um, and so that's just to try to identify and protect cultural resources. And we found ways to allow burning and cutting around these sensitive sites to uh, help still forward the effort of doing timber sales, but also protect the cultural resources. Uh, one of the cool things we found was this. This is actually an Aspen stand that's been carved. Um, this is just fascinating 
fascinating because this was probably done by a sheep herder in the 1930s, but he tried to record some history. And so what that says, and it kind of wraps around the tree, which is a fascinating arbor glyph, uh, which is a term we use for uh, Aspen glyphs. Uh, but it says uh, three white men and a Mormon was killed here in 1857. Um, interestingly, you know, they separated white men and Mormon and it is they wrote 1857, even though all the other handwritings from the 1930s. So there's some sort of history this guy was trying to convey or just screw with future archaeologists. Who knows? But kind of one of the cool things we found. Um, we also found some fairly cool cabins. So um, these are from the late period. So these are 1920s to 1930s. Uh, the one on the bottom right, we call the doggy door cab. Because if you look in the doorway, you see there's a little cut right in that side of the door that the dog could go in and out. And there's a matching cut on the interior door. And there's still little tufts of fur today caught in there. Um, the hinges actually on this door date from 1925 exactly. So that gives a good indication of when this structure was built. Uh, we also see a transition in construction styles from the first period to the second period. Uh, we also see expressions of ethnicity. So the Scandinavians and Northern Europeans had a unique way of making log cabins versus those that didn't. And so saddle notching, you know, your common Lincoln log kind of way of building cabins was more of a Central and Southern European way of building log cabins. Uh, Northern Europeans, so uh, Norway, Finland, Scott, you know, those countries, they had a different way of making cabins. And those are more like notching, like you would see on cabinets, you know, dovetail notching or half dovetail notching. This uh, photo is actually a false notch. And so all they did is take logs, put them together, and then just nailed them into place. Now, as dry wood expands, the front fell down. So that's why you have a weird construction like that. This is a late period site built for speed, not permanence. But on the flip side, you have this guy. This is at the Steel Creek Commissary. And you can see the full dovetail notching uh, on that corner. And then they even faced uh, the front of the log cabin. Facing just means they flattened it out to make like almost a, a flat front, really conveying more permanence than the structure on the left. Um, but still, better craftsmanship. So some archaeology. So in the 2000 and 2001 period, some archaeologists did go collect some artifacts. Mill Creek Commissary, because of its location, has been badly impacted by looting and vandalism. A lot of people still camp on the site and poop on the site and do all sorts of things on the site. Uh, but they collected some artifacts. And so you see whiskey jug up in the upper left, uh, splitting wedges of full uh, broad axes on the upper right. That's an Avon, good house housekeeping brand, um, toothpaste bottle in the center. The can in the bottom left, that's a whole in cap can. So that's, you know, 1860s to about 1920. So that speaks to that early period. Period. All our food came in lead sealed containers until the 1920s, FYI. Uh, and then, you know, obviously saw bit there on the bottom right. Uh, as we move further east to the Steel Creek Commissary, some other artifacts are really fascinating. That timepiece on the left, that's actually a pocket watch, porcelain face pocket watch made in Switzerland. And it was found right in front of the foreman's house. And so you kind of think about telling those cool stories about this foreman, you know, going outside to get the crews going and going and he lost his pocket watch and those six foot snow drifts, never found it again. Maybe a sled ran over it and cracked its face. And so it just became part of the archaeological record that still makes that personal connection. Um, now that top middle, I'd love to be more interactive and ask you, what do you think that is? Uh, those of you who said harmonica read? Good job. That's actually the inside of a harmonica. We've actually found several up in the North Slope. So thinking about that part two talk where the Scandinavian dances, musical instruments, right? They're playing the harmonica, they're playing fiddles, they're playing musical instruments to have recreation. We can see that. Um, on the right, that is a ketchup bottle. Um, that's actually a very tall glass ketchup bottle. It's amethyst, meaning it's turned purple. So again, 1880 to 1920. And then that's a, a, a strap razor in the bottom. So that's where you would sharpen your uh, razor blades on. And then the Mackenzie Creek Cabins has a, an interesting artifact. I'm going to let you ponder that thing on the left of your screen for a minute. Uh, but you see the center, William Franzen and Son, WFNS, Milwaukee. That's a bottle maker's mark from about 1900 to 1929. Now, I've done a lot of archaeology in Utah, and nowhere does this bottle mark show up more commonly than in the Uintas. And this tells 
to me that the loggers were being supplied out of probably Midwestern stores and then hauled out on the railroad and then shipped up into the mountains. William Franzen and Son were the main bottlers for Schlitz, Blatz, um, and even Pabst. So these are probably alcohol bottles for the most part. Um, and, you know, kind of speaks to that Milwaukee impact, that Midwestern impact on our beer consumption in the 19th century. Now that you've had some time to ponder, what do you think that thing on the left is? If you said corset hook, you're right. If you didn't, it's okay. You don't usually see this side of a corset. Uh, this goes into the front. And so when the corset comes around, these would hook an eye into the front. And so keep yourself steady. Um, and so obviously corsets were designed for female use, um, but uh, there are stories of men using corsets as back supports. And you think about the heavy work these guys are doing on the North Slope, they could easily have hurt their back and are using this as a back support. Or very easily could be reflecting those women that we talked about in the last part of the talk. But still, still you know, you're thinking this logging masculine landscape and someone's wearing a corset in the Uintas in December. Makes you think. The last thing I want to talk about is um, some of the things we've neglected uh, to really record. Like we don't typically record stumps and roads and the archaeological landscapes of these logging areas. And so we're missing some information. This we started walking to this timber stand up above Smith's Fork. And we're like, all these huge diameter trees, I'm talking like four foot diameter trees, have been girdled by an ax. And this girdling means just cutting through the living part of the tree in order to kill it. And we're like, why would you kill perfectly good, huge trees? It doesn't make sense. Well, as we were at a public meeting, we, there was a bug guy talking, uh, entomologist for the Forest Service. And he's like, oh, you know, we know we have records of the tie cutters actually being employed to do early pine beetle control. Fascinating. And what they thought in the 1930s that pine beetles attacked old growth trees. And so the idea was that if the tie cutters could be paid, go and kill the old growth trees, then the next pine beetle epidemic wouldn't hit that stand and we could have saved an area. Well, we know very well now in 2020 that pine beetles don't operate like this, but you can still see some of those old trees that were girdled in the 1930s still standing. Um, and still, you know, kind of makes that whole story go link. You know, we're up here doing surveys because of pine beetles, and now we're recording sites that have association with early pine beetle control efforts. Um, and so there's a huge archaeological legacy on the North Slope, hundreds of log cabin sites, uh, roads and splash dams and tons of stuff. If you do go choose to visit the North Slope and go look for some of these sites, take photos, uh, go visit, go explore. But you know, please remember, these are sometimes the only places that those people can tell their stories. They've died, they don't have photos, we don't have memories of a lot of these folks. So the only way that you know, we can interact with that history and remember their, their work is through these physical places. So when you visit, visit with respect. Uh, leave things where you find them, take photos, um, show others where these things are, but tell them to continue that ethic. It's only as a community can we protect these things for the next generation. So I hope you learned something about the tie cutting industry in Utah, and uh, I'll catch you on the next time. Thanks.